Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. My guest today is Vandana Shiva. She is a world famous environmental activist from India. She's a laureate of the Alternative Nobel Prize in 1993. She's author of numerous books. Her latest is called Oneness versus 1%. Thank you very much for being on the phone. My podcast. pleasure. I want to begin uh, early on. You were not uh, supposed to be an activist. Uh, you were a physicist. You wanted to work in nuclear energy. And then uh, you came across in the early 1970s what is known in India as the Shipko movement. Can you explain us how you came across? <coughs> yes, I was training to be in India's nuclear establishment. But then my sister woke me up to the hazards of nuclear. She was a medical doctor. And I went deeper into theoretical physics. I was going to Canada to do a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. And before I went, I wanted to visit some of my favorite forests in the Himalaya. I've grown up in the Himalayan forest. And this forest I had trekked in was gone. The stream that came from this oak forest was gone. And while returning to Delhi, I talked to a tea shop owner And he talked about how there's a new movement called Chipko. So in my heart, I said, I'm going to come back every vacation and be a volunteer for this movement. Women came out to say, we're going to hug the trees. You cannot cut the trees because from the trees come our water. The trees stabilize the mountain and prevent landslides. The trees prevent floods and droughts. And they also give us everything we need. We will be huggers of trees. The name Chipko means to hug. And I learned all my lessons of ecological activism from the women of the Himalaya who'd never been to school but knew everything about ecology, knew everything about biodiversity. What they called soil, water, and pure air today talked about as ecological functions of the forests, that forests are not timber mines. And a lot of my change in the understanding of the fact that nature is the basis of economy came from my engagement with Chipko. My respect for women's knowledge, indigenous knowledge, came from my engagement with Chipko. And it totally turned my own head upside down because of physics, you know, high in the world, you know something others don't. And you re I realized everyone has knowledge and right. you must respect it. So uh, you've uh, became really engaged in this. Uh, you've been an opponent of uh, big multinational corporations, especially... Uh, Monsanto, uh, to name just uh, one, uh, because of what you describe as their nefarious influence on uh, agriculture. Uh, there are a number of examples. There was the BT cotton uh, in, in India, uh, especially. Uh, and you said, you know, uh, this is not a matter of helping farmers grow their land, but actually making them dependent on those big corporations. Um You know, the entry of corporations into agriculture is so wrong because the corporations only bring poisons. Most of them have roots in Hitler's Germany in making gases to kill people in concentration But that's camps. What, that was not their aim. Their aim no. was to give people enough. No, no, no. The aim was to make chemicals that kill people. After the wars, they said, why should we stop making these chemicals? Let's say now they'll kill pests. They will give fert fertilizer. Fertilizers were made in the same factories that made explosives and ammunition for Hitler's That's Germany. It's not the same goal. No, the, the, or, the companies are the same and the processes are the same. So your rhetoric might change, but the goal does not. The materiality of a death-making chemical doesn't change when you say it's now for feeding the world. I did a book on the violence of the Green Revolution because Punjab, the most fertile land of India, was destroyed. And then when Monsanto came in as a result of globalization, because till uh, the 90s, 90% of the seed was in farmers' hands and the rest came from the public sector, from the government labs, the research institutions. So Monsanto came illegally, didn't take any approval, with the promise that they would increase farmers' incomes and have this magical technology to control pests. Well, the bollworm is now resistant. Farmers are in debt. Farmers are committing suicide. The area has been ruined. The pollinators are gone. There's no pollinator. The groundwater is gone. So there's nothing about the ecosystem. So I save seeds. We brought organic cotton seeds back. We work with the Gandhi ashrams on hand spinning and hand weaving of this organic cotton. The economy in the villages where we work has jumped tenfold because now the wealth is staying 
in the village rather than being siphoned off as Monsanto's profit. And I read a new study that says because we've saved seeds, we brought local seeds that can be saved back into the economy. Monsanto has lost 11 million. I, I want to get to your latest book because uh, you widen, I would say, uh, your attacks is not only Monsanto and, and the likes, but also uh, others. Uh, you uh, attack the what you describe as the billionaire uh, dictators, especially uh, one man, I should say, uh, Bill Gates, uh, who uh, you describe as the Christopher Columbus, I'm uh, quoting you, of modern times. And that's not a compliment, obviously, uh, whose mission is to impose, quote unquote, genetically modified organisms and digital dictatorship to small farmers across the world. Bill Gates, who's donated billions uh, to improve public health in poor countries and so on. You're saying essentially he's a dictator and he's there not to help, but to make people poorer, more dependent Well, Bill Gates is actually continuing the work of Monsanto uh, because Monsanto had so many movements and we held a, a tribunal on Monsanto. Um, a buyer bought up Monsanto, but when Bill Gates pours money into Africa for feeding the poor in Africa and preventing famine, what's he doing? He's pushing the failed green revolution. He's pushing chemicals, pushing GMOs, pushing patents. And now pushing new... Knowingly, or he thinks it's a good thing and he may be wrong. Well, there's it's not enough, the same thing. There's enough evidence of what it does. There are enough letters to him from farmers of Africa, from governments of Africa to say, this is not the way to go. The United Nations accepts agroecology working with ecological systems as the best way to go. Now, you, um, Bill Gates is trying very hard to shift the patenting issue now to digital. So you just take a genomic map and you say, my invention, you don't create a seed. Seed is self-organized, self-making, and evolution in continuity. Just by read, making a map, a genome, and you have no idea what the seed does. And he, this is something he's pushing very, very hard. My book records how he financed DivSeek. Um, I've talked about how he's pirated. Seeds we have saved that tolerate salt and floods, and he says invention. This biopiracy is a bit like Columbus, where Columbus is supposed to have discovered America. When he basically went as a pirate. Why do I call him today's Columbus? Because he's carving out new colonies. Software should have stayed open software. So, so he say, you say he has a, a strategy, a nefarious uh, strategy, what you describe as philanthrocapitalism uh, is a nefarious enterprise. And so you're not saying he's using the wrong methods. He's pursuing a wrong goal with self-interest. You also uh, uh, attack Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the founder of, of Facebook, saying... They're all linked together. I mean, this reeks a bit of conspiracy theory, doesn't it? Well, you know, my book is based on the new evidence that's coming out. All you have to do is the, or, or see the ownership, and I have data in the book on how there's common ownership. We stopped Mark Zuckerberg from trying to get into Indian agriculture. It was a big mobilization of people who believe in the open internet. What did he want to do? Well, you know, basically what they do is they mine the data from the farmers. And right now, all over the world, there's new debates on privacy issues, on the right. data mining. There's new books and new form of capitalism, which is surveillance capitalism, where you basically have turned human beings into your new raw material. So Bill Gates does both. He takes living resources and our seeds and biodiversity, mines it into data and wants ownership along with his friends, and Mark Zuckerberg mines your data and your behaviors and turns it into the raw material, both of corporate world for selling things, which is why strange advertisements pop up after you've sent a message to a friend, and manipulating elections. I have a chapter in the book on the hijack of democracy. You have enough data on what happened with Facebook selling data to Cambridge Analytica and how we are popping up with artificial intelligence leaders, this is a major threat to democracy. So this is why you're calling them billionaire dictators, because you think they're not helping democracy, but actually threatening and even killing it? I mean, Wait, isn't this it, a bit have, too much? No, I have grown up in, in India 
that was post-independence. I've grown up in an India that had absolutely no corporations. I've grown up in an in India where democracy works. And therefore, when I see the imposition of digital transactions and criminalization of cash between poor people, I basically see this as a dictatorship. I call it di di digital dictatorship. When I watch, not just in India, but in Africa and other parts of the world, now that we have the data that is showing that native seeds have more nutrition, they produce more food, they have no cost because you don't have to use chemicals, that local biodiversity is the way to feeding the world, in spite of all that evidence, in spite of the evidence in the United Nations, in the FAO, in UNCTAD, every agency, Bill Gates is still imposing and forcing GMOs, which is a failed enterprise. And he's not just imposing GMOs, he's taking what has failed and rejected my, by governments. My government threw the BT aubergine of Monsanto out. Bill Gates resurrects it in Bangladesh. We rejected the golden rice for solving the problem of blindness. He finances it to continue through Philippines. So he's taking all the failed projects with the wrong thinking that life is like a word program and can be chopped and cut and pasted when it's an amazing complexity of self-organization and scientists call it autopoiesis, self-organization, writing your own poetry. That's what life does. He is absolutely ignoring all of this new knowledge that new science is giving us and imposing a failed technology with a huge cost to the planet only so there can be monopolies and people and farmers aren't free to have their seed. Vandana well, Shiva, obviously uh, you have strong views and we're happy that you were able to share them uh, with us. Thank you very much for uh, watching this interview here on France 24.